Terso has open sourced their core engine, LibSQL, which is a fork of SQLite, the world's most popular, most widely used database. If you didn't know, SQLite is a database that is mostly embedded in applications like web browsers and any other kind of deployment where you need a database that is uh, access usually locally within an application and all the data is stored there and it's really powerful to do that but it's so powerful that you can go way beyond you don't need to just have it into one spot but you can have it in two spots or three spots you could replicate it you can have it even access one of the powerful benefits of LibSQL that Terso added, they added this on top, is the ability to access that embedded database remotely. You can access it from anywhere else. They added a server layer to it and a replication layer, and it's really, really powerful. It's also super easy. SQLite's the most deployed database in the world because it's just the simplest to use, and it's also really powerful and fast. It makes, that means that it's affordable to run if you're gonna look at all the other solutions that, you know, Postgres and MySQL, they're going to be more expensive for you to run. Though, you know, there are some inter industry standard, like, what do you call it, uh, bench, workbenches and things like that. You could also just open up a workbench with SQLite database anyway. So you're going to get most of what you need from SQLite with additional capabilities of lower cost and higher scale. It's easy to develop with and it can run locally. It's just super easy. If you haven't checked it out yet, check out LibSQL by Terso. You're familiar with SQLite, the world's most popular database. Well, it's the most widely used, right? You, you might not have heard about it or you might have. And it is just the most widely used. It's just adopted. It's running in my web browser right now as we speak. That's just the way to end. So check it out. There's something that Terso built for us that takes the SQLite code base and turns it into an, a fork, an open source fork. And they even added a special mode, a server mode. With our embedded SQL database, such as you know SQLite, they're great for a lot of use cases. Sometimes you really want to consume your database as a server and they made it super easy to do this. What's even cooler is that you can run local replicas with in-memory read access to pr provide you with the most powerful, most efficient serverless running technology available. You would not be able to outcompete this in any other way. It's, I would say, one of the most efficient approaches. So we can use the SQLD, check this out. They have a lot of installation options such as Homebrew, Docker, and you can you know, build it yourself through your own tool chain. Just a cargo build, right? They support a lot of extensions and they integrate with bottomless replication. That sounds really powerful. You just point it to an S3 bucket and you get unlimited data replications, copies, backups, and synchronizations. You just pass this flag, enable bottomless replication. You do need some, you just get some environmental variables going here and then you point it at your S3 bucket and then you provide it your S3 credentials and then you can replicate. Isn't that cool? What we need to do next is see it in action. Let's see it running locally. Let's run our own SQLite server using Terso's fork that they called LibSQL. Comes with a built-in server called, they call it SQLD, and you can install it through Homebrew Docker and your own Rust toolchain. We're gonna do it the easy way. The most easiest option is a single click. You just click copy here to get your Docker image and you get it up and running. Let's check this out. So now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna copy and paste the command they gave us. I'm gonna run this in non-daemon mode so we can see the output. Here we go, we got some output. Uh, we're looking at, this is what we see. We got SQLD up and running. It says all is good, welcome. And all we have to do now, oh, it's actually running. So you, we have it launched, it's listening on port 8080 on our local system. And so we've essentially set up our own SQL database that's running locally in our system. And to test it, let's make sure we just run a statement against it just like this. So you point it at your local host, port 8080, and then you give it data and it's a JSON. And then we're just gonna run select. So this is a, you know, the typical SQL. This is my favorite hello world. It's just saying select 1000. We just run that, boom, instant. Instantly returns, because it's running locally, of course. That's gonna be pretty fast. But you get your data. I wonder if we can alias this uh, as thousand. There you go. So now it looks more like what you're used to. So you got your columns and then the rows associated with it. You've got your own SQLite database running as a server using Terso's LibSQL. All right, we have our LibSQLite database running locally on our server, which we can access remotely basically from anywhere. As long as we have an IP address that can connect to our server, we'll be able to access our SQLite database remotely, which is something that SQLite wasn't originally designed for. So this is 
a nice addition that Terso has brought into the ecosystem here. We can use our libsql server. So we have our container running. We're able to access it with a, a simple query. Now you'll probably, you could just, you know, execute uh, any code with a, a curl, right? Or any kind of request, like request library, like HTTP library within your native language. The good part is Terso did bring with us a nice way to do that within a set, a set of languages, right? They brought in Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, Rust, and they made it really easy. So all we have to do is import our library, just uh, npm install libsql. Once we have that up and running, we just point uh, our URL here. We need to import our database from libsql. Then we need to make sure we've defined our, our uh, you know, where the server's located, right? So this will probably be uh, a different IP you know, if it's not running locally, it's running on another server. As long as you can access it, you'll be able to read and write to that database. Create a new database. So DB equals new database and then the URL that we were using before. And now we just want to test if we can read data from the database. This is my favorite hello world for SQL. It's just a select 1000. And then using their semantics, we prepare it, which is necessary. So if you're familiar with prepare statements in SQL, you'll see things like question marks being used as placeholders. That's uh, necessary to prevent SQL injection and other kinds of attacks. It helps helps you in that respect. So we'll execute our select statement and then log the output. And then we'll see what our test looks like. So we can say npm start. And then what we should do, we did, it works. Oh, that's so cool. We can even have an alias, thousand. We'll run it again and see, should we should see thousand, one thousand. So you can use all your standard SQL, like inserts, creates, things like that. You will have, Full access. Of course, what you'd want to do is, you know, make sure you add in protections because you want you don't want anyone to say drop table because that would be that that would be a problem, right? I would see I would see there's a problem. Yeah. So you of course you know be careful just like anything else uh, because it's not you know uh, intended as a full hosted system uh, out of the box that you'd get like MySQL or Postgres where you do have user level permissions and access for read and write permissions or administrative permissions. You don't have that with this, so you'll want to make sure that you are uh, using the system properly, you probably only want user level access in a way that's read only and things like that, as most must that you possibly can. And the trade off though, however, I would say is phenomenal performance, you get really good performance and a, a significant amount of flexibility, you can even have this running in a read replica mode. So that way you can distribute the database across the world and have local running copies that gives you access to be able to have faster user experiences. So no matter where the user is, as long as you've distributed your database near the user, they're gonna be able to read from that database instantaneously or well, pretty pretty quick at least. All right, we're gonna do a bonus section here for libsql, our SQLite database server that we can add replication capabilities to. And I think this is probably the most powerful part of the whole picture. We can have a remotely running database as a, you know, the primary, and then we can connect into it and sync up all the data to copy that over to a local replica. This is really powerful because that local replica can then be used as a read replica that is gonna be near your end users. And it's really easy to set up and configure. And I figured we might as well give it a try and see to make sure that it's working the way we want it to. Creating an in-app replica and syncing it. Oh, okay, this is so simple. Number of lines of code It's really straightforward. So we use an opt called a sync URL, and then we define our local database. We could even have just an in-memory database, right? If we don't want, if we don't have access to disks, we might be running in a serverless mode where disks are in ephemeral. We can run this in a uh, memory mode. We'll want to make sure that we have data in our database, and so what we'll do is. We'll insert using our curl command some sample data. We've got Alice, aliceexample.com here. We'll run this and that inserts that I already I already ran that. And then we'll make sure that the data is there. The data's there, right? So we've got user ID one, Alice, Alice at example.com. So now we know the data is there. Then what we can do is open up using uh, libsql client. We'll open up a non HTTPS connection, right? A non SSL connection, right? So this is an HTTP. And if you wanted, you know, to make sure it's secure or, you know, you could also use uh, libsql, this pattern, this will uh, be useful in production scenarios, but we're, we're testing it right now. 
So HTTP it is. We've created ourselves a client. We don't have any auth token. Then we're gonna select star from users and then print out the result. We'll run our example and boom, we got it. We got the data. ID one Alice, Alice at example.com. It works. We did it. And look how little code is involved. It's so straightforward and simple. We created a read replica. And now this data has brought closer to our users. And so they have a, a much faster experience when reading for data. Here we can see kind of what's going on behind, behind the scenes here. So we've got our server who's running the client code. You might also have another server over here running the client code that's accessing our remote replicas that could be either uh, on a different server. Uh, we also have a primary over here. We can see that if we are gonna insert into users on our replica, which is running remotely or locally or embedded in our serverless application, it's gonna delegate a write whenever a write occurs to our primary database server that we have spun up running in Docker. And if we select from users, uh, we might also have a local replica that we are gonna be reading from the primer if we haven't uh, gotten the data yet or if it's already synced then it's going to read directly from the replica now there are additional instructions that we need to follow to do what i just demonstrated we need to have a tls configuration for grpc tls uh, uh, communication they make it really easy they include a python script for cert generation and then you just uh, spin up your server with all the certs as needed and obviously port 5001 is gonna be our replication port. Then you launch your server using the, the data that you've uh, created using those uh, cert files. And now you can easily run statements against them and you can enable replication within the client directly. They also have client authentication, which is kind of neat. They do JWT, uh, you know, JSON web token. And as long as you follow this standard, you should be able to access and sort of secure the data on your system beyond just, you know, firewalling and IP and IP uh, sort of um, who has access to what IP and what server thing. You can add an additional layer of uh, protection. Oh, neat. Then you can obviously we can deploy it with Docker. Uh, which is uh, you know something that we're doing, but you could also deploy it on fly which allows you to specify different locations and where you want your servers to lo uh, be located. There's a lot more to it. There's additional replication and uh, multi-tenancy ideas and sharding, a whole bunch of other things that you could consider, but it, that will completely depend on your deployment model and how users access the data.